Good morning, everyone, again. Do we have more energy after that, or do we need the band to come back up? Or we'll just have Sean come up and play some drum solos to get the energy going here. Well, I'm just gonna start off with my sermon title because I usually don't remember to say my sermon title to like page three of my notes and then it just doesn't fit. So my sermon title this morning is Tough One. Not because we're gonna learn anything about being tough this morning, but because studying for this passage this week was an incredibly tough one to study for. Um, has any, do you, I don't know if this is just me, but does anybody ever watch back old sporting events? <laughs> Every single day when I'm at the gym on the elliptical, I watch back an old motocross race for two reasons. First, I know that they're 35 minutes long, so that helps me time my workout. But B, while I'm on there, I can study what the riders are doing, the lines they're taking, the different ways around the track, and it keeps me preoccupied to not realize that I'm sweating and my legs hurt. But I do it all the time. Even though I know the outcome of that year's championship or I know who wins that race, I'll be watching it and let's just say James Stewart crashes in a turn. I'm like, oh no, like I, my heart just drops again and again. And, and, and I know how the season finishes though. Like he goes on to win the championship. Why am I... Why am I so worried? But I feel like that happens a lot. I mean, if you guys are into that weird sport, bas basketball, basketball, like where they just go back and forth nonstop scoring points and anyone can do it who has a pulse. Um, sorry, did I say it out loud? Basketball, yeah, it's like you could know that the Lakers are gonna go on to win the championship, but LeBron James twists his ankle and like, oh no, it's over for them. We just get so invested. And last week, we ended in verse 17 where Peter said that we may need to suffer for doing good if it's God's will. And some of us, when we hear the fact that we need to suffer as Christians, it's just like, are you kidding me? Come on. Like that's, and we act like it's the end of the world that we're gonna suffer. But to, this morning, I wanna remind us that the battle has already been won. We already have victory. We are on the winning team. And so as you come in and you approach suffering and it seems like your world is ending in front of you, remember, like I say each and every week, fix your eyes on what we have in Christ. Fix your eyes on the cross because that cross to the world looks like failure and the end. But to us as Christians, that cross is our sign of victory. So... Like I said, my sermon title this morning is Tough One, and I must admit that this is possibly one of the hardest passages of Scripture I've ever studied in my life. And we ended in verse 17 last week, so I was going to preach on verses 18 to 22 this week. And when you, when you start in verse 18, yeah, like you can read it. It's written in English, so I understand it. But as I tried to break it down to study it, I thought it was written in like, French or something. I couldn't understand a single word I was reading. And I did something wild, Gateway. I did something pretty crazy. I'm going to tell you about it. I went back to verse 17. And I decided we're going to start at verse 17, even though we studied that last week. Because when you read today's passage in context with verse 17, it is still hard and it is still difficult, but it adds a little bit of light. So if you're in this room this morning and you love Jesus, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. And that is where we're going to be this morning. Since I don't hear any pages turning, I'm just going to assume you're already there. 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 17, he says, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism 
which corresponds to this now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Let's pray. God, we need you today. Like we sang, Lord, we need you so much. And Father, I just pray that as we approach this passage, Lord, it's, it's your word. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. We know that you're going to grow us. We know that we're going to be encouraged and challenged through it. Father, just help me to speak your word. Help me to speak clearly and open our eyes to behold wondrous things from the passage this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we break down this passage this morning, our first point is there is only one way. And like I said, to better understand the text this morning, I wanted to back it up to verse 17. Because if we're going to suffer as Christians, as we looked at last week, we need to suffer for doing good. It needs to be that our suffering that we're enduring is because we took a stand for the gospel, that we took a stand for the word of God. And like I said, I think a very common trend in the church of 2023 now is you, po you share some Ron DeSantis quote on Facebook, and next thing you know, your cousin unfollows you, and you're like, oh, I'm being persecuted. Uh, no, you're not being persecuted. If you posted the gospel on Facebook and people started attacking you for the gospel, that's what you should be, that's what we should strive to be persecuted for. And so Peter's very clear, it is better to suffer for doing good. And he doesn't say that we're gonna suffer. He said it's better to suffer for you if that should be God's will than for doing evil. <clears throat> and so if we're going to suffer, it needs to be for doing good. Like I said, not because of something we posted, not because you went out drinking and got a DUI and now you can't drive. You're like, oh, I'm suffering. Not because you were unfaithful to your spouse and lost your entire family. It needs to be for our faith. If we're going to suffer, it needs to be for the name of Jesus Christ. Before Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 3, there was no such thing as death. It didn't exist. There was no end to life. Death is a result of the, of the fall. And another way to interpret Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Quite literally, we die because sin entered the world. And so, as we approach our text today, it says in verse 18, well, coming off of verse 17, it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be the, the God's will than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins. So it's, 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 you're not alone. You're in good company. Christ also suffered. It's not like Christ lived this life and is prescribing to you all the things that he didn't take for himself. No, Christ himself also suffered. And I love this once for sins. Death is a result of the fall, brothers and sisters. And so when we think about the life of Christ, what doesn't make sense is that a perfect, sinless man died. Because if, de if death comes from sin and Christ never sinned, and as we looked at even the way he was conceived, sin was never passed down to him, how, why did he die? But it says here, Christ suffered once. That word suffered could also be translated died in, if, in some different translations. So it could be Christ also died once for sins. He never suffered for sin ever in his life. And we suffer because of our sin a lot. I gave a couple examples, but those are really harsh examples. Maybe you get in a, a fight with your wife and you suffer a bad night's sleep on the couch. Maybe you, because of your bad parenting, your kids go out and rebel or do something, and now you're suffering because of that. We suffer a lot. We suffer daily because of our sins. Christ only suffered for sin one time in his life. Think about that. Once. And then look what Peter continues on to say. The righteous for the unrighteous. So Christ was righteous. He was sinless. He was perfect. He should have never died. There's no reason for Christ to have ever died. But he did die, though. 
he did suffer one time, a very painful, excruciating death. And it was because we sinned. It was because of our sin that the almighty, spotless Lamb of God had to suffer one time. The righteous for the unrighteous. And as we looked out on Good Friday, he, he, this was God's almighty, perfect, sovereign, master plan. Because as God looked out at creation and realized we could never make it to heaven on our own because we were so sinful and so lost, that something had to be done. And so God in his sovereignty said, I'm going to pay that price. And he sends his son down to live a perfect life. And we, why, why is it so important that Christ lived a perfect life? Because in the Old Testament sacrificial system, they sacrificed a spotless, unblemished lamb. And so Jesus living a perfect, sinless life was the ultimate spotless, uh, unblemished lamb. He suffered once, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Jesus is the only way to heaven. There's no other way that we can get there. You can, you can line your bedroom window with every cute little crystal you find at the store and invite all the demonic powers into your bedroom through your crystals. You can get a little Buddha statue and rub its belly every morning on your way out the door. I don't if that's how it works. You can sit crisscross applesauce and hum to yourself and try to clear your mind. There is only one way to heaven. All of that other stuff that the world tells you, oh, do this and do that or do this. It doesn't work because God has clearly said that there is one way. Jesus says, I am the way the truth, and the life. And Christ suffered one time for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, and the result of that is that he might bring us to God. Think about that verbiage there, church. This is so amazing. That word brings connotates that we are with Jesus. Think about it. If I get invited to a work party, they're going to send it to me. It's going to say, John Augusta plus one. And I bring Ali with me in my car. You would say that I brought my wife with me. But if I go there and I tell Ali about it, and she, she comes after work and meets me there, I would use the verbiage, I invited my wife to come. If she comes with me, I brought my wife with me. If she meets me there, I invited her. You're like, John, what are you saying? Jesus brings us to heaven. He came down, died, paid the price for us so that we can go to heaven. And it says, so that he might bring us to God. When we were studying a, a few months ago, we looked at the fact that it is God's pleasure to present us before his glory in heaven. It, it brings God joy for us to come to heaven and be with him for eternity. And I think that as a church, we've dumbed... And, and I don't want to raise us up at all because we are worthless sinners and we're nothing without Christ. But on the other hand, we've allowed ourselves to feel like we're just going to be eternal slaves in heaven. No, God of the universe looked down at us in our helpless condition and said, I need to save them. And he sends his son down to make a way for us. Jesus brings us to heaven and it's God's pleasure to present us to his glory. We get to be in heaven in glory for eternity, church. That is amazing. Christ died one time for sins. It was our sin that hung him on the cross. He did not deserve to suffer even once, but he did because our sin nailed him to that cross. The righteous for the unrighteous. And the result of it, church, is that we get to be brought by him to heaven, to be presented before the glory of God for eternity. And, and Peter goes on. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. He suffers once. And, and so Jesus is the only way to heaven. If you think that any other way you read about on Google, I mean, Instagram, 
Social media is just pumping out all these great ways to get to heaven recently. None of them will get you there. Anything other than putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ will leave you coming up short on eternity. And let me tell you, that's one shot you don't want to miss. So we see here that he suffered once, that he might bring us to God. Jump down with me to verse 22. Who has gone into heaven, talking about Jesus here, and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. So Peter's been setting us up for this here. He's been loading the bases, and now Mike Trout's up to bat. He's going to hit the grand slam home right here. Ver chapter 2, verse 13, Peter says, be subject. Chapter 2, verse 18, Peter says, servants, be subject. Chapter 3, verse 1, likewise, wives, be subject. Be subject, be subject, be subject, be subject. We're to be subject to our leaders, our bosses, wives, to their husband. And here is the grand slam, crack it over the fence. We're in Boston, it's going over the green monster. Why? Because everything, angels, authorities, and powers are subject to Christ. He is in heaven at the right hand of God. So we can be subject to these authorities he's put over us, trusting that they are subject to him. And in being subject to Christ Almighty, we glorify him by subjecting ourselves here on earth. It's just beautiful, church, how God works all these things together. Jesus is the only way to heaven. He died. He paid the price. He made the way. He is the way. And we can trust in him because he is alive and actively reigning in heaven with, Christ, with God right now. He paid the price. He kicked death in the teeth, rose again, and is reigning. Church, that's the only way to heaven. If I... If, I tell you always that I love you guys, and I do. And so you need to understand, I want you to know that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. You can come to church every single Sunday of your life. You can do good things every single day of your life and get to heaven and hear, depart from me, I never knew you, you worker of lawlessness. Because the only way to heaven is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. So I said off the top, this text was very hard to understand. And you're probably like, John, that was, I think that, I, I understand that. I think we're good to go. Point number two is I need Advil. Because at this point in my sermon, I needed some Advil to continue studying because just buckle your seatbelts. We're going in. So the great Martin Luther said about this passage we're studying this morning, a wonderful text is this, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the Testament, so that I do not know for a certainty just what Peter means. I cannot understand, and I cannot explain it, and there has been no one who has explained it. So now insert your John Augusta in the picture, reading that Martin Luther can't even explain this passage and knowing that I have to try to explain it to you guys today. So then I started, I had my MacArthur commentary, my MacArthur, so all these different commentaries and every single one said something different about this passage. And every single commentator said that they don't really understand this passage. And so I, in one commentary, it said that there are over 180 different views of what this passage means. And so as we approach verse 19 this morning, here are my initial thoughts as I read this text. Where did Jesus go to? So clearly verse 19, we're talking about Saturday between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Where did Jesus go to? Did he descend into hell did he go to Hades? What is this prison they're talking about here? Is it its own place? Who, who did Jesus proclaim to? Was it all the unsaved people who have ever died? Was it just demons? And then what did he proclaim? What, what, what is this message he proclaimed? Did he, did he preach the gospel? Did he do like a victory lap to, to show everyone 
that he wasn't dead. I mean, I mean, what? And so as I started studying this and seeing that there's so many different views, I started thinking of what would my mentor tell me if he was still here with us today? And, and he would say, John, isn't it great that we can't understand this passage? Imagine how boring it would be if we could understand everything about God. Imagine how small God would be if we could understand everything. And, and here's the great thing is, is we're going to be learning about God for eternity. We're not going to get to heaven and understand everything. But we're going to be learning about him. And, and thank you, God, that you are so awesome and majestic that we can't understand everything about you. And so as we approach our text this morning, I'm not going to try to make sense of something that God has intentionally left for us to not understand. What I'm going to do is take what we do know, take where, what all commentaries align on, and see how we can apply it and grow from it. Sound good? So verse 18 ends telling us that Jesus on Good Friday, look what Peter says. It says, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And then verse 19 says, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So I think that tells us at least that what's happening here is Jesus is in the spirit form. His body's still dead. So that's why I put us on Saturday. And we know that he goes to proclaim something to the spirits, to these some ones in prison somewhere. And then when we get to verse 20, it kind of gives a little more context. Because they formally did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. So we know that these spirits who he's proclaiming to in prison did not listen in the days of Noah. Okay, so let's go back to the days of Noah. God is awesome and he lets us know what happens there. In Genesis chapter 6. We know that there are fallen angels who came down to earth, inhabited human bodies, and made children with human women. And it says in chapter 6, When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, referring to angels, saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose." Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, uh, also meaning giants, so the, this breed of giants was born from these angels coming down and, and making children with the women, were on earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and bore children to them, these were mighty men who were of old the men of renown. Then the Lord saw that their wickedness was great and that every intention of their thoughts and of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth. And so we know what happens. He tells Noah what's going to happen. Noah, it's not like Noah snapped or went down to the boat store in Kassaic and bought an ark. Noah was building this ark for years and in building the ark was telling people why. So when Peter says that God was patient here, people had opportunity to repent and come to Jesus, but they didn't. They continued to rebel. And so when I think that he went to proclaim to the spirits, that word spirit in Greek does not line up with the term souls for believers or soul, the souls of the unbelievers. It's that same word spirits that's used to refer to fallen angels. And they're in prison, and we know that, that from Jude, when we studied Jude a couple months ago, that there are spirits that are bound, being kept. It says in Jude 2, 6. And the angels, referring back to Genesis chapter 6, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So we can... There's a Again, there's so many different ways, but me being the one talking right now, I think that Jesus in his spirit form, so on Saturday, his body's in the tomb, goes down to this deep level of Hades, because remember, the, the eternal lake of fire is going to happen in the final judgment. He goes down to this the darkest level of Hades 
for, reserved for these angels who have fallen and are bound in chains. And he proclaims something. Let's take a breath. There's so much more to unpack here. There was a show a few years back on TV. You may have remembered it, The Biggest Loser. And it was where obese people competed to see who could lose the most weight and then ultimately at the end of the show, the most body fat percentage. When I think biggest loser, I think Satan. Satan is the eternal biggest loser. Let me tell you why. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14 is the story of when Satan fell from heaven. And if you look at verse 12, It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God, and I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth to tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let its prisoners go home? All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out away from your grave like a loathed branch." Whoa. Huh. Whoa. Turn over to Ezekiel 28. This is another view of the fall of Satan. Ezekiel 28, verse 12, it says, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You are the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Let's stop there. Satan wasn't just some like low, like just entry level angel who just graduated angel boot camp. He was one of the most beautiful angels that God made. He was special. And I've heard that Satan's body like made music just when he existed in heaven. Like he was a musical instrument of worship in heaven. He was set apart. It says here, you are a signet of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence, in, violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as the profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuary. So I brought fire out from your midst and it consumed you. And I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Talk about biggest loser. It's that right there. He was perfect. He was the number one angel. God said you were perfect. You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and beauty. And because of that, Satan wanted to more. He wanted to be like God. And as a result, he was cast out and is forever the biggest loser. Satan's pride led him to try to be like God and he was cast out. And so in Genesis chapter 3, Satan deceives Eve into eating the fruit. He said, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? 
And then he goes on to say, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. So the same thing, the same MO, Satan wanted to be greater than God. So now he deceives Eve into eating. You're, he just doesn't want you to be like him. So man eats. Uh, God comes down, chapter 3, verse 15. God promises Satan that he's going to be destroyed by the Messiah. Genesis 3, 15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And then you fast forward to Esther, chapter 3, 1. I'm not going to read it because it's an entire chapter. But Satan now, because he knows he's going to be destroyed by the Messiah, tries to prevent the Messiah from ever being born. And in Esther chapter 3 through chapter 4, we know that there's a genocide of the Jews during this time. Second Chronicles chapter 22 verses 10 through 12 is another example of Satan trying to destroy the Messianic line. <coughs> well, guess who shows up? The Messiah. And in Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, we know that Satan tries to have the infant Messiah born. In chapter 2, 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise man, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children between Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to that time, and he was ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. When that fails, when he can't kill the infant Messiah, we know in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, or Luke 4, 1 through 13, that Satan tempts Jesus to abandon his entire earthly mission. He tempts Jesus to just, to sin. When that fails, you hear the, the overwhelming reoccurring theme? Failure, 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 failure. When that fails, he incites the Jewish leaders and their followers into a mob and they crucify Jesus, bury him, and even set a guard outside of his tomb to make sure he stays dead. Joke's on them. So there's definitely a celebration happening in the demonic realm as we approach Saturday. They think, finally, we got him. He's dead. And Jesus, back to 1 Peter, though he was dead in the flesh, he was alive in the spirit. In which, so in which, meaning in the spirit, he went and proclaimed or preached to the spirits in prison because... They did not formally believe. So there's this idea that they won. There's this victory like, oh, we killed the Messiah. He's dead. And Jesus, like, can you just imagine when he shows up alive and proclaims that death does not have the final say, that all the power of hell, all the demonic realm that since day one has been trying to end God's plans does not have hold on our Savior, church. God is a just God. He says what he, he, he does what he says, and so he told Satan that he would be killed by the Messiah. And as the demonic celebration is happening, guess who shows up alive? It's the Messiah. It's Jesus. And I hold that because of Peter's reference to the times of Noah, He's referring that Jesus goes down to these fallen angels who are bound in chains. And I believe that what Jesus proclaimed is that never once could Satan stop him and never once will Satan stop him. And not even death in that moment could stop Jesus. And I just like, as I'm studying this passage, you all know you've dove into the deep end of the pool, you get to the bottom, you collapse your legs and you shoot to the top. I imagine that Jesus is like, you're not going to stop me. And then boom, and he kind of shoots out of the grave. That's why the stone was rolled, because he just, pew, right out. But like, there's just this victory. And as you read this, as confusing as it is, I hope you get excited like I am that there's victory here. Death could not hold our Savior. 
So if you want to believe that these are the unsaved people and Jesus went all the way into hell and preached, whatever it is, he went down there, he proclaimed, and he came back alive and is at the right hand of God right now, church. There are, there's so many, so many different takes on this passage. There's some commentators believe that this happened after he resurrected, but before he actually made it to heaven. There's, there's so many, but I just, as, like I said, as we look at all the facts, I think that's a safe base to slide into. And, and the, the particular details, where he went, what did he say, that doesn't matter to us. What matters is that we serve a living God that def who defeated death. And as we read through this, we see that time and time and time again, the enemy was trying to stop God's plan from happening and never once could he stop it. It's only through Jesus that we are victorious. And now in verse 21, we're not out of the confusing waters yet. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Huh. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you're here and you're like, whoa, baptism saves you? Let me be very clear. Baptism does not save you. Baptism is merely an outward symbol of an inward change inside of you. If someone is on their deathbed right now, gives their life to Jesus and dies without getting baptized, they're going to be in heaven with you. There's so many believers who have never been water baptized who will be worshiping with us in heaven. Water baptism does not save us. And I'm not contradicting scripture here. We're going to dive into it. But let me just tell you in our 21st century mind, we think of baptism as water baptism. That's not what Peter's talking about here because water baptism is just a sign of an inward decision. What baptism literally means, the word baptize means to be initiated into or to be found in. And so when we are saved, we are baptized, we are initiated into Christ. We've, we've heard about it so many times, alien righteousness, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that when, when God looks at us, he sees his son. He sees the finished work of Jesus. We've been baptized into Christ. And so baptism, yes, being baptized into Christ, putting our trust and faith in Jesus for salvation saves us. Baptism in water? No, no. Baptism into Christ? Yes. Noah and his family were baptized into the ark. They went into the ark and that when the water came and flooded the earth, it was the ark that was their mode of salvation to the other side. We as Christians are baptized into Christ. And when all the sin and, and ick of this world come in and fill it up, we're safe in Jesus. And when we reach heaven, we're going to be found alive and we're going to get eternity in heaven with God. So baptism, which corresponds to this. So remember, we've got to read scripture in context. It's corresponding in this to Noah and his family getting into the ark. They were baptized into the ark in that time and it led them to life. We are baptized into Jesus, which leads us to eternal life. He quite literally says, not as a removal of dirt, because if you got water baptized, you'd get clean. But as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Church, we are only saved through Jesus. And it's through the resurrection of Jesus that all of this is accomplished, because not even death had power over him. He defeated sin and he defeated death. And when he resurrected, we now resurrect and get to go to heaven with him. 180 different interpretations of this passage. What matters to us, Gateway Bible Church, is this, is that we're going to suffer for Christ. And, and that's great because Christ also suffered himself so that we could have victory at the end of the day. 
We saw a couple weeks ago in chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, that he suffered as an example for us, that when we suffer, we can look to Christ and see how did Christ handle this? How would Christ handle this? And we can handle it like him. If Christ never suffered, we would never get to suffer. Do you, do you hear, see that? If Christ never suffered to save us, then we would never be found in Christ to suffer for his name. But Christ suffered, and as a result of that, we get to suffer. It's an honor, it's a privilege to suffer for the name of Jesus. And our Savior is alive, brothers and sisters. He is at the right hand of God, reigning in all authority, all rulers, and all power are subject to Him. That is who we serve. That is who we suffer for. And so if you're here in this room, and you're hearing these words, and, you, and you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus, then you're never going to get to heaven. All of these encouragements, all, all this promise of the inheritance and eternal life, it's not for you. But the good news is Jesus came down and he suffered and he died to make a way for everyone. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him. So if this is not you, Jesus died so it could be you. And you need to put your trust and faith in him and he promises to save you. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the promise of scripture.